next we will have the session peering dynamics in Southeast Asia and there are three speakers in this session the first speaker Miss Jane Coffin she is responsible for the expansion of the internet infrastructure strategy in emerging economies she is now a director of development strategy of internet society so please join me in welcoming Miss Jane Coffin on stage thank you Thank you very much. Um, I'll be very quick so we can get to George. We'll have a lot more interesting data for you from the region. <laughs> um, again, thank you. And a particular um, thanks to the team at BKNIX and the TH Foundation. Um, the Internet Society is, a, is very proud to help sponsor this event. We do um, sponsor other events in the region and globally to help grow the Internet. Events like this are super important. So. Don't under underestimate that this is one of the first important steps to growing that peering environment. Um, you've already done that with the neutral internet exchange, and we're very supportive of that exchange, and growing other internet exchanges in the region with partners. You've got great experts here, like Philip Smith from NSRC, George from APNIC, and the, the great workshop you're about to have the rest of this week. Um, Thailand is at the crossroads, we think, of being a major peering hub as are other countries in the region. We were just in Pakistan about two weeks ago with Philip, uh, who did a technical training there. You're going to see this region become even more important. You not only have the economic wherewithal, the innovation, but the population size alone. And of course, you have what is the next generation of connected people, children. They're your next customer base, right? How many people in the room have children? Raise your hand. How many of them use iPads or touch your phones, go up to the TV and try to swipe the TV? <laughs> Next step up with uh, probably some of the technology in the region. But those children are becoming so wired at young ages, it's, it's a little scary. <laughs> but think about them, and as the speaker from Nectech said, the country is looking at a digital plan, and ASEAN looks at digital regional plans. It's really exciting to see what's going on and how growth is happening in the region. One thing we would suggest, and we're trying to do some mapping right now in other regions, is more robust wrapping of the routes and prefixes in the region. We're seeing some coders that we're working with. We're putting servers into the, using the code from some uh, technologists in Europe um, to look at Africa and the growth there. Your growth is 10 times that, of course, of Africa's. But it's important to also demonstrate to government officials and others in the region exactly what the growth rates mean. Will the internet take up its economic development? Many of you hear probably some of the discussions from the UN on the sustainable development goals. We all know that we've been trying to grow infrastructure, which grows development, which grows economic development. But the key thing is you can't stop working at the micro level, which many of you are micro macro, right? Not to say this is important, but growing this IXP here in Thailand is critical. And the one we know in Pakistan that will come online soon, we hope in Islamabad. And of course there's Cambodia and Laos, Brunei, Malaysia has an IX. You're part of a huge ecosystem. As Jeff was pointing out, this isn't something that's by itself. And so it's really exciting to see what's going on and what's growing here. As we said, the IXP is a critical part of that puzzle and bringing more peers in. When you see the growth at the IXP here at BKNX, they started out with three to four peers. Now they're at nine. That's really strong growth. Some IXPs don't get past the four to five peers in the first two to three years. So congratulations to the team, of course. Um, again, we have a local team here in the region. Rajna Singh is the chief of the bureau here. You'll see more people come in from our side from a technical perspective. I do not pretend to be an engineer or a technical expert. I know I can see the growth of infrastructure and the planning and know that this is key for the region. Um, one thing we would like to say also is that we will look forward to seeing um, Thailand as one of the key ASEAN hubs. That's something that um, the NEC Tech representative just spoke about. This is key. Suggestion for moving forward was mapping in the region. The one last thing I would note um, from a governmental side, if you can support the neutral exchange, this is critical. 
Um, encourage wireless community networking. That was one thing I didn't see in the plan that we just saw. We're supporting those local community wireless networks, whether it's VoIP, text, some internet connectivity, because some of those unconnected villages may not need or want right away the full internet uh, connectivity. They may see it as important, but they may just need simple connectivity. Wireless community networking can help do that. Dr. Kanchan and her team are working on projects like that. We are as well. This is critical to start that value chain of internet connectivity, just those first connections. Um, liberalized submarine cable backhaul from the landing station. If you have a monopoly at the submarine cable, you're choking your connectivity and the ability of other carriers to bring traffic into the country and throughout the region. Equipment, this is one of my favorite topics. If customs duties and taxes are high on equipment, your internet is in jail. You can't get that equipment in, it's complicated. We sent a server recently to one country, it's in November, it's still there in customs. So if your internet is in jail, you can't grow it. So for government officials, think about yourselves also as an ecosystem of governmental organizations. It's not just one government agency acting alone. Same with the Ministry of Education. If you're trying to educate children, internet connectivity is critical. So that's the government working together. Um, again, I noted start mapping your routes, key thing, and routes in the region so you can watch the connectivity grow. And also note for investors, more investors, of course, this region is about to explode as far as innovation, connectivity, and economic development. So we're looking forward to the 2017 Pairing Forum. I just wanted to say thank you, and I'm finished. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Jane Coffin. So let's proceed to our second speaker. Um, he is from API X Association. Uh, may I invite Mr. Katsuyasu Toyama? Please come on stage. <laughs> Sorry for my delay. <laughs> I said it in the backside. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for introduction. Uh, my name is Katsuya Stoyama, and I'm from uh, our APIX Association. And congratulations for the first uh, neutral internet exchange in Thailand, and also uh, uh, the disappearing forum. Uh, 100 people, over 100 people were attended. So this is amazing, okay? Oh, so congratulations. Oh, just a moment. <laughs> okay, so oh, today I would like to briefly talk about an, uh, our APIX associations and the uh, situation in uh, internet exchanges in Asia Pacific regions, okay? Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so first, oh, for myself, I introduce myself. Oh, my name is Katsuyama, and I work for uh, JPNAP, and one of the Japanese internet exchange, and also uh, act as a uh, chairperson of an uh, APIX from the beginning, okay? And also I'm doing uh, kind of an uh, IX Federation board member and Global Peering Forum board member, okay? And, but some of oh, you, I met you before uh, when I worked as an entity communications, uh, the past three years uh, as a uh, head of uh, internet services in the Asia Pacific region. Okay, so next slide. So, what is an uh, oh, uh, APIX? As I mentioned, oh, the APIX is an association of the internet exchange providers in the Asia Pacific region. And this was established in uh, 2010. And uh, its objective is to share the information or experiences regarding the uh, internet exchange uh, from the technical or uh, operational or business point of view. Okay, so please see. And uh, as you may know, these kind of IXP associations are there in the world. Oh, uh, mainly these are the five associations, uh, maybe I do not know that in North America, but in, the, in the Europe, the URIX, and uh, in Africa, AFIX, and for the, uh, the South America or Latin America region, for LACIX, it's an association of uh, internet exchanges. Okay, please next. 
And also uh, we have an IX Federation. Uh, these are the board members of uh, our IXP associations get together and coordinate with uh, uh, each other in, uh, uh, for IXP associations. Okay, so this is I IX Federation. Okay, so go back to the oh, APIX. Oh, this is the criteria of an uh, APIX members. The important point is in uh, layer two and the neutral position and not enforce the uh, purchase of the transit services, uh, internet exchanges. So this is a very important point. And this kind of uh, the neutral internet exchange promotes the peers between the ISPs and uh, it also promotes the internet, uh, penetration of the internet, I believe. Okay, so uh, we, uh, as an APX association, we would like to promote this kind of uh, neutral internet exchange in the Asia Pacific regions and uh, collaborate with other uh, IXP associations. We would like to uh, expand or uh, expand in, uh, such kind of a neutral internet exchange all over the world. So the current I oh, APIX members is listed here. Uh, the approximate, uh, yeah, the 22 IXPs are the members, and of course, the BKNX is uh, probably our members. And, uh, oh yes, uh, these are the, uh, the mark, <laughs> trademarks of the uh, IXPs. Some of them do not have that. And uh, currently, we are in 15 countries and economies, uh, from, from the 15 countries and economies. Uh, so Japan and the Korea, the China and the Taiwan and Hong Kong, uh, also uh, Singapore and uh, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia and New Zealand, Australia, and uh, oh, the Malaysia, uh, oh, so Bangladesh, the India and Nepal. Oh, these are the oh, very important uh, countries, and also of course the Thailand. Okay. And the recent news is uh, oh, the Chai, uh, in main mainland China. Uh, we got a members uh, from the mainland China, the Chinese, uh, C-H-N-I-X, uh, they call it Chinese. Uh, they started, just started their internet, neutral internet exchanges in the basin, okay. And this is in the uh, current uh, committee members. And I from uh, oh, JP Lab and also from the Nixi and uh, oh, the Me from the Mega IX and the HK IX and the Twitch. Well, maybe Brian here, here, no? Okay, okay, so these are five are the Australian committee members. Okay, next please. <coughs> and we had already uh, 13 meetings in the uh, Asian Pacific regions. Oh, usually uh, we had uh, the, our meetings uh, collocated with uh, our APNIC or APRICOT meetings. Okay, Take, please go to the next, okay. And the topics discussed here was in the, these kind of things. And from the technical point of view, Oh, the, the la and the last meeting, we discussed about an appearing DB. Oh, maybe you are very familiar with an appearing DB, and currently they are oh, migrated to the appearing, uh, appearing DB 2.0. Oh, the previous one, appearing DB 1.0, is mainly uh, oh, operated by uh, oh, the ISPs. Uh, so IXP uh, cannot, could not update their information in the peering DB. But in uh, these peering DB 2.0, uh, the IXP can also update their information. So now we have a uh, concrete uh, information about an appearing or interconnection all over the world. Okay, and also we discussed about, uh, oh, sorry, please go back. <laughs> yeah, oh, the routing server software. Also, uh, the, uh, the market situation in uh, some countries, uh, this time in the Philippines. Yeah, and also we had uh, some kind of dis discussion about uh, our membership fee. Yes, please, next. Okay, uh, from now, I, I would like to uh, compare uh, about uh, internet exchanges in the uh, Asia Pacific region, okay? So go to the next, please. Okay, and uh, we, Often use, uh, we often use these kind of uh, uh, indicators uh, for uh, IXP performance. One of them is the uh, uh, number of the ASM, the second one in the traffic, uh, the peak traffic. 
And I added one L as an average traffic per ASN, uh, which is divided, uh, which is uh, the peak traffic is divided number of ASN of each IXPs. Uh, this uh, shows that then how big eyeballs and the content providers are gathered there, or how much broadband is penetrated in the market. Okay, so go to the next slides. Okay, so this, uh, the from now, all the information I gathered from these uh, IXPs of their uh, corporations. Okay, so please go to the next one. The first one is in the number of ASN. Oh, unfortunately, uh, the Equinix Singapore uh, is, does not disclose their data, but in, uh, oh, relatively they are uh, oh, the, the big one, so I put on their name on this one. So they are the, oh, unfortunately, the, part <laughs> the top one. And uh, these are the uh, list of uh, oh, the big uh, IXPs. So from the no uh, number of the ASN point of view, uh, the Equinix is number one, the second one, the HKIX, and the third one is uh, the New South Wales IX in Australia. And also the fourth one is a Mega IX from the city. Uh, this is also in Australia. And for fifth one is a JPIX Tokyo. And the BKNX is in uh, this position, but they're still very, very young. So I, uh, maybe in the near future, they will grow. grow. So please go to the next slide. And the, from the peak traffic perspective, uh, of course, uh, also the Equinix Singapore is the number one, and the second one is the HKIX. The third one is the JPNAP and the uh, JPIX and the Kings in the Korea. And VKNIX is still in this position, uh, but then it's okay. Yeah, they are starting. <laughs> okay, so the next slide, please. And average traffic per ASN. Oh, the top one is in the Kings. Uh, the Korea is known as in the, a very broadband populated uh, country. And also the second one is the JPNAP. Second, third, fourth is the JPNAP, oh, Tokyo and Osaka. And also the JPIX Tokyo is in the fifth one. So Japan and Korea is an apparent rate uh, countries of the uh, broadband. But the still, oh, the VKNX is positioned here. So comparing to the previous two flights, the VKNX is in a placed higher position. Uh, this means that I think that, that in Thailand, uh, the broadband is in the open rate. And also uh, oh, the smartphone and the 4G started and uh, started to deploy it here. So and the VKNX position is uh, here, I think, okay? So the, Next slide, please. <coughs> so I think, oh, the BKNX and the Thailand uh, will grow very rapidly in the near future. Oh, this is because I think uh, in the previous presentations, uh, the growth of uh, the traffic or the users of the Thailand uh, display. And <coughs> I think such kind of uh, oh, the potential of the growth uh, there in the th Thailand. So I believe in the near future, oh, Thailand or BKNX will be the, oh, the biggest internet exchanges in the uh, Asia Pacific region. Okay, so go next. So thank you very much. And also, again, uh, congratulations of that new, oh, the new BKNX peering forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katsuya Toyama. Okay, let's proceed to our third speaker. Um, he's a specialist on Internet Number Resource Certificate Framework, a co-author of many RFCs. Currently, he is a senior research and development scientist at APNIC. May I invite uh, George Michelson, please present. Hi, everyone. Um, before I go into my talk, I'd just like to talk briefly about a grant initiative that we have recently entered into. Um, I actually owe Jane an apology because I believe some of this activity is co-branded with ISOC and we haven't given you enough recognition on the slide pack. Um, is it the middle button or the left? Or oh, you're doing it, click. <laughs> click. So we have four different buckets of grant funding that's currently out in the community. It's a total of about 360,000 Australian dollars, which is slightly less than that in real money. 
Um, I, I really like to encourage you to think about applying for this. I think you have enormous capacity in this region and in this economy to submit proposals which could sustain this grant process. I mean, Professor Kanjana, you, you are an obvious candidate to have students that are capable of doing good, solid work in this space. I would like to encourage all of you to think about applying for this money. Um, the community impact grants are my particular favorite. I've been involved in the ISIF grant process for a number of years, and we have made a focus of investing in capacity building for women's health, education, child education initiatives in the region. But all of these areas are worth investing in. The co-branded one, I believe, is the cyber security initiative, which I think is something ISOC has also been focusing on. I'm sorry we didn't include that in the pack, but please think about applying for this cash, put forward proposals and participate in capacity building in the region. Click, and this is where you go to for more information. Click. Okay, so my talk is not actually really an exchange point talk. I am going to say some things about exchanges and about peering, but it's more a general information talk about what's going on. Click. And I have to apologize for making you sit through this. Um, I have used great art of the Renaissance period and the Victorian era just to lighten things up. And if you find this amusing, the idea actually comes from a website that you may find more entertaining. So if you find my talk boring, just go to this URL and look at the pictures there. Click. So this is what we're doing now. We're a bunch of philosophers sitting in a room having a conversation about building out an exchange. Um, I think I'm probably, where's the laser? This guy here. So it's good doing this, you know, it's good to plan stuff. Um, this is actually by the artist Raphael. I wish Raphael Ho from Equinix Hong Kong was here because he's, his name is on the pack. Click. The goal here is to look at the public data that APNIC has in our delegation records and also from BGP and try and understand the internet as the rest of the world sees it looking inside Thailand and to understand with you guys what might be some of the next steps we could do. Click. Uh, it, it's not really meant to be like this, okay? It's not this bad. Click. So we were quite aware as APNIC that some of our public data is very stale. We're not doing a good job of communicating with you about what we understand about resource utilization. So we're trying to build out information in the public eye that tells you guys what we know about you to help you understand your planning processes. And we think we can do this to try and improve um, decision making in general because we want to build the best network we can. We want to help you guys build the best network you can to understand your long term investment needs, to understand if address policy is something that's affecting what you're doing. Click. So it's kind of like this. Um, this is actually art by William Blake. If you ever see English football fans singing Jerusalem, do you know that song? And did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's pastures green? Well, William Blake wrote that song. He wrote the words to that song. Polymath, pop star, artist. Click. Okay, so the reason we're doing this using public data is that we wanted you to feel like you could also investigate the same sources because this is about public policy. It's important that it's reproducible. So the stuff that I'm showing you, it's not magic. There's no special black magic information. Well, there's a, there's a little bit because the UN ITU data we use is a little hard to get at. And some of the data that we're collecting about what we see people do because of privacy concerns, we can't share that directly. But we can, we can share data reductions. And the idea here is to encourage you guys to think about looking at the public information sources to do your planning. We want it to be reproducible. And we do intend making a long-term commitment. We've actually been doing measurements now for um, six years in the public eye. Click. So this is the class of public data sources we're using. The first one, the delegated files, this is a common format that was agreed by all of the registries quite a long time ago. It's a simple CSV style file and it's quite complete. It has all of the address assignments as a historical data series 
and it has a unique identifier that actually is about you as members, but we don't put your entity name there. We hide it behind a masking unique code. We've got, BG, we've got AS data, we've got V4 data, we've got V6 data. So the second source we're using is the BGP dumps, which are, again, completely public. As Jeff said earlier, it isn't necessarily the same view everywhere, but the principle is the vast majority of this information is something you can all see. Click. This is what it's like when you build an exchange point. Sometimes you have to rip out a lot of old cabling. Click. And this is what it's like the day after when you've finished ripping out all the cabling. Click. OK, so how do we process this? Click. Well, we take that data from delegated and we group things by the prefix grouping and the AS by economy data. And then we combine that using the BGP information about routing visibility. And we're also doing that when we measure V6 end user capability. We're tagging it by the prefix we see it from, the AS that's originating it, and the economy that we're seeing it come from. And we do counts. We are actually thinking about doing this down at the membership level to be more explicit. We know some of you use multiple ASs to split your routing in interesting ways. And then we do a collation against the UNITU data. I'd, I'd like to say that the talk you gave, I'm sorry I can't pronounce your name properly, but the talk you gave about government planning, it was very obvious to me that you have better data than we could see about population. And you may notice that when I come to some slides in a minute. So then we're tabulating all of this and putting it together. Click. So this is an example of the kind of data we're going to be building out for each economy in our region and at a higher granularity for each member. Click. So this part, this is coming from the ITU and the UN source, and you'll see I've got the population as about 68 million. You had it as 65. We do, a, we do like a CPI-derived population growth model. I think it's probably not accurate for Japan. Their population efficiently declined over the last decade. So we slightly got ahead of the game with you guys. We had you as 23 million users because that was the last public declaration that was made to the ITU. Now, I should say it's not uncommon for there to be significant drift against the ITU figures. Two years ago at an APNIC meeting, the Chinese delegation announced 25% growth in one year. And I think you actually exposed 38 million as your current figure against 23. That's very significantly different. And I think at a planning level, it may be that um, government agencies, statistical entities have a role here to talk about what is the appropriate frequency of update for this data in the public eye. Because I think an annual return may be masking a significant amount of growth that's taking place. Click. So the next stuff we have is the stuff that comes from APNIC, delegated files. So the AS count and the number of addresses that we know are deployed in Thailand, that comes completely from the public data that we've exposed in the delegated file. Click. So then we have the part that's about BGP, which is the visibility of that data and the amount of ASs we see active in the system. Click. And then we have the measurements that we're doing. Click. And then we have the der derivation, where we take some factors between these and combine the data together. Click. Now there's way, way too many colors. You can't look at that. Click. So I'm going to focus on three things that I think we need to talk about. And that's the phenomenal drop-off in the number of assigned ASs and the number that are visible in BGP, and the drop-off in the number of assigned ASs and the number that are visible in BGP routing V6, because I think this is the core of the issue that I'm here to talk about. Click. So where is the six? That's, that's a real question. We know it's been allocated. And we know from the previous slide that there is significantly more six available per head of population, even taking into account our adjustments on internet users. There is significantly more six available than there is four available. And we know that you have a lot measured by ISP. I did a simple reduction just before coming here, and I can see that you actually have 92 organizations that have been allocated V6. So, on the one level, I could say, oh, you're not routing it. There's not enough routing. But 64 out of 93, that's actually really very good. That's world scale. So you guys are announcing six comparable to other economies, not only in region, but worldwide. The problem is not that you don't have the six. The problem is that you haven't achieved deployment 
visible to end users. Click. So this is a league table based on visibility of V6. This is actually data which is not substantially changed from the last time I spoke in Thailand. Um, Professor Kanchana organizes an annual workshop, AI and Tech, and it's a fantastic opportunity for international collaboration in research. I've made some very, very strong relationships with people from that. I'd, I'd really like to thank you for the work you put into organizing that. It's a good meeting. And at the meeting the last time I presented, I showed figures that are broadly similar to this. This is essentially the story of V6 capability inside the Thai government entities and inside the Thai tertiary education system. And you guys, specifically the ones in government and research, you get six. You understand six. You, you know how to make this work. The numbers are compelling. It's visible all the way through that tertiary education and research framework. Click. The problem is, if you then look at it based on ranking by sample count, it has almost no visibility with the agents of significance that are actually serving your national economy. With one exception, which is down at number nine, that I'm going to come back to later. Click. Okay, so we have to talk about this. We can't pretend there isn't something to talk about here. This is a real problem. Click. So here is a view that is one of the research visualizations we've been working on inside APNIC. This is a product of Byron Ellicott, who is in the research group, and he's taken the visible ASs that are involved in exchange activity, data exchange activity, inside the Thai economy and compared V4 to V6. So on the left, we have a really lovely diagram of the degree of connectivity, the distance into the center, is an indication of how much we're seeing prefix activity there. It's similar to the skitter diagrams that CADA produce. It's a cruder version, but very quick to draw. And we can see that there's really quite good internal connectivity, and then there's a huge number of ASs on the edge, which are effectively stubs. They're singly connected into someone else. But the story on the right-hand side, which is the V6 peering story, although the same people are in the same kind of center mesh, it's a much more sparse story there's actually less richness in the V6 connectivity that's taking place inside this economy. Click. Okay, so this isn't actually that bad a story because it's only the view that we can see externally doing simple derivations from VGP. We think that you have better parts. We think you have private peerings. We think you have private relationships. But it is, it is sparse and you could do much better than this leveraging things like the initiative to build out the exchange presence here. You have an opportunity to use that decision to improve your V6 peering relationships. And I think these opportunities are fairly obvious. Click. So other people are also able to inform what's going on here. And the RIPE NCC have the Atlas measurement system. I think quite a lot of you have got Atlas probes. It's quite a good deployment here. It's an interesting box, small very small device that will put a small kilobit level of traffic out and can do trace routes and check DNS systems and check behaviors. And I've got two slides that I took from a pack that Miriam and Fergal presented earlier this year. Click. And this explains a tool developed by Emil Arbin, the IXP Country Jedi. And it gives you an idea of how much traffic stays local. It uses trace routes between the probes in an economy to see where the packets actually go. What are the intermediate routes? And it can show you the distinction between V4 and V6. And it can also show when they transit known exchanges. The tool's under development. It's very open. If you want to get involved, Emil would love to have participation. Click. This is Emil, and it's got a bit more detail. If you go to the pack, there's the URL that you can get involved in. The other initiative worth noticing here is the open IP map which is another attempt to construct some extra value by collating information about the disposition of addresses, leveraged off what people know for themselves. That's something you might like to think about. Click. So this is a static view. The tool is quite dynamic, and it shows you the size of flows. And if you click on links, you can be shown the specific relationships between them. But what this is showing is the Thai traffic that we could measure from, I think, about 15 probes has a quite significant volume of peering relationships that necessarily transit the west coast of the states, or Japan, 
or flow down to Singapore. Your traffic is not staying local. Click. So in a more zoomed in view, we do know some of these are agencies that are actually strictly speaking outside Thailand and are using Thai resources to have a local presence for some regional engagement. But we also know that some of this is actually customer visible behavior and it's happening in four and in six. It's not only happening in the one technology space. Click. So you have an opportunity to look at this and understand the dynamics of packet flows that are taking place in your own systems. For instance, you could take your web logs, you could look at where the traffic's coming from, you could pop it into this to compare at the AS level and understand where you're exposed to offshore data flows. Click. And I think personally that this is something that at a strategic level you really want to tackle. If you imagine as a customer perspective that you're trying to use technology to talk to someone you know is only across town or in a, a different village or perhaps in a city in the south of the state, but your packets are flowing via Singapore or flowing via Japan or flowing via America, that's a hugely suboptimal experience for them as individuals. It's added delay and it's exposed to all the risks of fiber breakage and at a national strategic level, that's a fantastic amount of data about your national economy that's flowing outside the boundaries of your own control. I don't think this is something that you necessarily want to do without conscious thought. You need to think about where the data is flowing. Click. So how did we get to this situation? Click. Well, I did a quick review over the history of delegations looking specifically at Thailand, counting the resources by class that you guys got and the number of entities. And I've done a timeline as a set of graphs to try and talk a bit about the growth and the extent to which that might be influencing what's happening here. Click. So this is the combination slide that shows all four categories. We've got the growth of V4 with a very, very interesting flat transition. And we've got the growth of six. And we've got the growth of membership. And we've got What's the other one? Oh, that's right, it's 6-4. Yep, click. So if we take RIR membership by time, what I've done is I've taken the natural doublings. I've just taken some points where you guys basically doubled in size. And your first period, the early period through to the end of the 90s, mid 90s, you got up to 20 members and you doubled to 40 in about the same interval of time. There was quite a lot of rapid growth early, and I think there might have been a decision to slow down the number of discrete entities, because you entered quite a long period where there was no increase in the number of members of APNIC, people participating. But then across the 2000s, you had really quite marked acceleration. And if you look at the later stage, you'll see that the second doubling, so going from 80 to 160 members, happened in a significantly shorter period of time. And that has increased. We've actually seen an increase in the rate of new members coming from this region. So why might that be? Click. Well, the reason is also exposed in the AS data. We're seeing a marked surge in the number of ASs that are apparently being allocated in this region, which suggests an increase in the number of people participating in data exchange at that level. That's really interesting. Why are so many people getting involved directly in the BGP system? Click. Well, it's possible that it's a side effect of the introduction of the final slash eight policy. Because if we look at the timeline of address allocation, you had an initially quite long period with some accelerations. You then had a second phase, which was slightly quicker. Your third phase was extremely rapid. Your fourth phase, very, very, very condensed. But when we finally ran out of addresses. We entered this period where there's the rate of growth is essentially linear and against the scale of the number of addresses that were released in the early phase, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny growth rate. And the reason is none of you as mature members can get any more V4. You have to rely on your customers and your relationships that don't currently hold address coming to APNIC to get that small tranche of address, which is an essentially linear growth rate. You're bottlenecked behind the consumption rate of V4 in this model. Click. If you look at V6, 
well, it has a later start date, but you've had a really accelerated uptake in getting hold of your V6 resources, and it has skyrocketed, I suspect because we have a process that basically says, click here for your six address. So we don't feel that this is an allocation problem. It's not a problem of access to the resource. It's about the extent to which you're able to deploy this to actually make use of it in end user eyes. Click. Okay, so what's going on in the neighborhood? Click. Well, we're taking our measurement activity, looking at end users. We're ranking them by the number of random assignments that we make, which is not actually market share, but it's kind of interesting in terms of the number of random samples that people see. And we're looking at capability, how many of the people can actually do six. Let's go look. Okay, this is Singapore, which measured on a scale to 100% has been fairly flat at around 10%. Click. But one AS, Starhub, with a bit of an interesting glitch, Starhub has actually got to about 50% penetration. That's really significant deployment. Click. If we look at the ranking, you can see that by capability, there's an interesting range of people there, including some players who are not end user focused. Microsoft Corp, for instance, are clearly not predominantly in the business of serving end users. Click. But if we resort that by customers, you can go, yep, that one. You can see that the Starhub cable network is the fourth largest in a random sample. So the fourth largest player in that economy has jumped to dual stack. Click. Okay, Korea, again, very low capability, click. But one provider, SK Telecom, has actually jumped to 25%. Click. Now, this one is a problem for our measurement technology. We're not actually getting placements into mobile as much as we'd like. And SK Telecom is overwhelmingly in cellular. They've done a dual stack deployment using 464 Translate. So it's new handsets in Android that are being deployed into V6-based networks using DNS 6.4 for the four component. Click. And if you change the ranking, they're actually the fourth largest provider in our measurement, but I've been told officially by Kisa these guys have 50% of mobile, and they are very probably significantly higher in terms of their global impact in Korean capability. So we're under measuring. To all intents and purposes, half of the Korean mobile market is now exposed to dual stack if they get a new device. That is very, very significant. Click. This is Cambodia, and there's a small amount of capacity there if you look at this view, but if you look at the high volume, there really isn't significant activity in this economy yet. Click. This is Myanmar, and again, there is some capability latent inside the economy, but it's not actually yet end user visible. Click. Japan. Japan is kind of strange because this is an economy that by all intents and purposes really should be up at 80, 90% capability. Click. But there's a, and this is the view based on high level penetration. Click. But there's a substantive issue there to do with the architecture of their national fiber network. And much though it pains me to say so, the two NTT figures here are essentially the reason that Japan shows a sustained lower rate of deployment. If you look at the natural competitors, KDDI and SoftBank and Sonet, they have very, very high levels across all of their architected networks. Japan is busting with V6 capability, but it's been suppressed by an architectural decision that is having long-term consequences for their national deployment. Click. Malaysia. Now, Malaysia is a real success story. I think it's lovely that you guys are having an ASEAN focus meeting in here. There, I believe there's another one taking place this week elsewhere. But Malaysia is a phenomenal success. Click, and it's down to one ISP, TMNet, that has already reached 20% penetration. I believe that this is the former national monopoly telco, and they've decided to re-architect in this way. Click. So they've had a large capital investment around deploying V6. The figures here of capability lag a bit. We're calculating them using different sliding windows, which is why it doesn't match. But they've had really quite a significant effect on the whole of the national economy in six by doing this. Click. And if you look at it again ranked by eyeballs, you can see that they really are the predominant player. Click. Thought I'd throw in some other people. Britain, doing nothing for years, finally breaking through. Click. It's these guys. It's Sky. 
Sky is a very efficient cable provider that is running centrally managed customer premises equipment. They're using the mechanism that means they can remotely manage all the devices in their network. And they made a decision to deploy V6 at the beginning of the year, and they have been doing early release in 2015, and they've basically just gone full bore. They are actually at 50%. It just hasn't come through yet. So this is a game changer for the UK economy. They're at least half of the market there. Click. So again, you can see that in content side, there are, you know, people show up, click. But in capacity terms, it really is all about this one provider. Now, that really intrigues me. If you had a market with that many big players, Sky, Virgin, British Telecom, and one of them jumps, what are the other guys going to do? When are they going to move? I mean, this has impact. This has effect in terms of the expectation people have for service delivery. Facebook are telling us that if you have true V6 all the way into their core network, you actually get a better user experience, which potentially means Sky can start to do quite subtle advertising and marketing saying, Facebook's better on us. Click. America, click. Okay, T-Mobile, another DNS 6.4 with um, 4.6.4 Translate, they're at 50%, click. Comcast, total network move, they've done it. Triple play, V6, click. So here's their rankings, click. And again, okay, so the summary here, click. You guys have no shortage of underlying capability. You have the ASNs, you have the prefixes but your future growth is effectively harvesting linear rates of availability of addresses. You are now actively constraining your network technology behind asking your customers to apply for more V4. And this is where every other growth curve we have for you is in exponential growth rate. You are constraining yourselves because you're stuck in four. And you have very low exposure of V6 peering apart from in academic and government, where the capability is there. We know that you can do this. We also know that a significant volume of your peering relationships transit offshore. And we derive this not because of private information, but solely from public information any of you can find. All of this is publicly visible in the global internet economy. You can own this problem. You can solve this problem. Click. So if we do six, we can all go and party. Click. And these guys, AS133481, AIS Fiber, they have been hot on the V6 mailing list. Deutsche Telekom noticed this. Facebook confirmed it. Akamai confirmed it. Google confirmed it. Externally, we are seeing this one, I believe it's cable fiber, provider, one provider, we've seen them absolutely surge. They've made a decision to go dual stack, and it's publicly visible, and we're all out there talking about it. This story could be about you guys. Click, or things could get a lot worse. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you very much for an entertaining talk. <laughs> okay, and... For the end of this session, I invite all of the three speakers on stage once again, and I invite Professor Ganjana Ganjanasut, the Vice Chairman of TH NIC, to present a gift of appreciation to all of our speakers in this session. Josh, you're on, on stage. Oh. And Jane Coffin. And Katsuyasu Toyama. Okay, before we break, we have a short session called Peering Personals. And in this session, participants in this room will have a chance to introduce themselves and their businesses. This is for them to get a chance to be connected. And uh, participants will have two minutes each to talk about their businesses. And if you didn't get a chance in this session, there are three other peering personal sessions. And with this, may I invite 
Kun uh, Kitinan will take over the stage, please. Okay, good, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kitinan. So I will run the peering personnel along to the event for this round. We have two members. First is uh, TCC Technology. Please stand by on, on, on the side of the state. And the next is SGAX, Singapore Internet Exchange. So please welcome TCC Technology. Good morning, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are from TCC Technology or TCCT. Our company provides the IT infrastructure services, and we now have three data centers location in Thailand. And we have Asia Data Center Alliance in five countries, which include Thailand. Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. Apart from that, we also work with our strategic partners worldwide to deliver the reliable solutions like cloud connectivity and et cetera. We also position ourselves as a carrier neutral hub, uh, which is the preferred choice for both local and international multinational companies, and that's the very, very brief background about our company. And now let me introduce our management. Uh, over there is our general manager, Kun Busalin Pradit Yon. She is taking care of the operation. Uh, you will may later discuss with her. And myself, Walipon Sayasit, Corporate Communication Director, both of us and our team are here with aim to connect and collaborate with all of you. And last but not least, we would like to thank you, uh, VKNIC, and we do hope and wish this event one of the most successful forum of the year. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Willie Pond. So the next is Singapore Internet Exchange. Mr. Jeff. Hello, hi, good morning. I think I'm standing between you and the coffee break, so I'll keep to the two minutes, and I promise. Okay, um, I'm Jeff Chan. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing from Singapore Internet Exchange. Uh, first of all, I think I'll thank BKNX for giving us the opportunity uh, to share, to do a quick overview to everyone here. Now, um, in, in 2009, Singapore government, or to be precise, IDA, stands for Infocom Development Authority of Singapore, recognizes the need to create a national IX that's open, neutral, right? in addition to all the commercial IXs that were operating back then. So hence, Singapore Internet Exchange, or in short, SGIX uh, was formed. Right? Um, our, our mission is very simple, basically is to enhance the internet landscape by promoting peering. Um, and interconnection between service providers, it can be content providers, cloud providers, or any enterprises that has ASN numbers. Okay, now SGIX is an association-based IX, right? It is not commercial, it is not profit-driven. It's not a commercial entity. Um, it is members own. So basically, uh, we exist to seek and to represent the best interests of all our peering members, right? Today, um, you know, our coverage is nationwide. We have presence in multiple data centers, and we also have uh, partners that will bring our coverage uh, across the entire island. Right, next. All right. Um, interestingly, just now I was observing one of the slides from Dr. Uh, Sh uh, Shalom Poh, right, uh, about the land mass of Thailand. I do a quick calculation. Now, Singapore is only 0.14% of Thailand, slightly bigger than Phuket. All right. Maybe that makes our deployment a lot easier. All right. So today we have um, 
three core nodes. Uh, if you're familiar with Singapore, I believe a lot of you have been there. Uh, we're located in Global Switch, OneNet, as well as uh, Digital Reality, right? uh, East and West. Right. So um, and in, in addition to that, we also have, as I mentioned, we have several partners. Sorry, I think the alignment is a little bit out, but uh, um, they can bring our peering service into different part of the island, including other data centers, such as New Tech Park, um, Capel, uh, Equinix, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right, basically, I think we're all familiar with peering. So these are the key benefits that a member can get from peering. Now, definitely, uh, we'll improve the content, um, accessibility, okay, and hopefully, which I believe that you will have to lower the operating cost, especially the bandwidth cost, and I think that's important, okay, of all of your, all our members. Okay, now indirectly, uh, you increase your customer satisfaction and also create and also increase business opportunities. Okay, next. Now today we have hundred Mac port, although I think that a lot of us has pr probably think that it is something in the past. Now there be there are still some providers that needs hundred Mac. But uh, we are moving away, uh, now it's to really 1G is a norm, or even 10G is a norm. For members that require more than 10G, currently what we do is we will do a link aggregation or multiple 10Gs. Uh, but I think to keep up with the, with the increasing demand of uh, peering bandwidth, we'll be doing a infrastructure upgrade in Q3 this year. Right? Um, the ultimate aim is to uh, of course, is to offer more than uh, 10G ports. We are considering 25G, 40G, or even 100G, but I think probably 100G is the way to go. If you want more information, you can always uh, visit our website, which I'll show you the website uh, address later. Okay. okay, this is a snapshot of the traffic for the last 24, sorry, for the last 12 months. Um, as you can see that there's an upward trend Right, and it's increasing. Today, our peak traffic, since January 16, 2016, our peak traffic has surpassed 70 gig. Um, and you can see that there's a significant increase from December to January onwards. You can see, and, and, and it's still climbing today. Uh, that's also because that's one of the uh, video streaming service provider that's connected. All right. Okay, next slide. Sorry? Oh, okay. So, okay, I just skip this. Yeah. Okay, just go to a website. All the information can be found there. Um, www.sgis.sg. All right. And the last slide, uh, if you need any information, you can just email us at info at, at, at sgis.sg. Or I'll be here for the next two days. You can catch me anytime. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, so the time is limited. Or I will close the uh, pairing personal one here. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention.